It's a story really about how history is made and how it's made by ordinary people. And people don't look like heroes and they don't look like they're anything special. But either because of some, something that happened to them or some passion or some conviction that they have, they show up as brave individuals. Scheinbaum is one of those people. He's an agent of history. Probably the key reason why Richard Nixon was impeached, because he supported Daniel Ellsberg and his right to a trial and to make his case. He's a guy who just somehow pops up, whether it's Vietnam, gone to Greece to save a guy named Pop Andreo. I do not speak Greek. Firing a guy named Darrell Gates, who was the police chief, just in the aftermath of the L.A. riot. Making peace with the Arabs. He's there. Uh, he's involved. He's made history in a way that I think stands up. And he's a guy you ought to know about. Our project, Michigan State, was known as the Vietnam Project. I was running the campus end of the project, hiring the people. It was 1955 when I got started. We had taken over from the French in 54 when they were thrown out. They're going to bring order and democracy, and they're going to fight the commies. And Stanley was all set up for this, you know. Uh, it all seemed good to him. We had just come out, less than 10 years before, of World War II and the Great Depression. We had fought both those things successfully, especially fighting the fascists. And we had, in some sense, saved the world for democracy. So we did have it in our minds that we could go around the world doing these things. I had been a student in economics, focusing on economic development of third world countries. And here was an opportunity, a mini Marshall Plan with a lot of American capital going into this backward country that needed support. In 1957, Stanley went to Vietnam to observe the fruits of his labor. It was not a good trip. Well, on this first trip to Vietnam in the fall of 57, I went out there to evaluate what work we were doing. And we had a five-story building there. And then I realized I'm not allowed on to a certain floor. What was odd about that was I couldn't look at the people I had hired to talk to them about their work. And what was odd about that, the Vietnamese out there, some of whom worked for us out there, were telling me what they were doing. They were CIA people. I think in the Michigan State Project, you start to see the truth of it, and that there was some really bad stuff being done. And he knew he was being used. I went along, although I was uneasy. I didn't like the just broad concept of an American university providing some sort of cover to a CIA operation outside this country. Nothing wrong with going over there and helping develop a constitution, helping develop a, a government in a place that had been unstable. But when the basic motivation was other than the interests of that country, but fitting into the American foreign policy interests of resisting communism, that made me very uneasy. I didn't have a smoking gun. This was the smoking gun. The actual charts showed you, you know, how you put somebody in a chair and tie them up, or, you know, how you do this. And, and this was the first concrete evidence, say, of torture. The measures were not always pleasant ones. There was electric shock, pliers, crush people's testicles, would hang them upside down, would throw them out of airplanes. Very abrasive, he said, what's this about? What are you bothering me? You know, so I said, it's about how you were a front for the CIA when you were the co-director. Andreas Papandreou was arrested by the Greek junta. We heard some banging on the front door. The situation was so dangerous, there was a curfew, and they opened the doors and they found George. And they put a gun to his head. Said, where's your father, where's your father? We'll kill you if you don't tell us where your father is. And then Andreas heard that. I saw the officer suddenly look up and freeze. They told him, jump. Jump, jump. And he jumped. And he landed on his uh, knee. And they started hitting him with the butt at the same time that blood was spurting out with him. And they pulled him down the stairs. My mother started running after him, and there was broken glass. And her feet were in the glass. So I chased after my mother. I don't know, can we stop this for a second? Stanley has become a key player for raising money in Hollywood. He's a mentor. He's a high-level kibitzer but it's his passion and commitment that has always attracted the Hollywood elite. Do you remember the name of the committee? Yeah, Energy Action. Good for you. Yeah, Energy, Energy Action. Action. Good, yeah. And there were about eight of us, about four or five of whom were business types, and about 
four or five of whom were actor types. Actors? Star types were lined up here. Stanley. There, there was Stanley. one. Stars, not star types. <laughs> there was Warren, Paul Newman, Redford, and myself. Even then, he was calling himself a movie, movie star, you see. I'm flashier. After his brush with the Greek junta, Stanley has committed himself to numerous political causes, but none has tested him more than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In 1987, the Intifada started. The violence of the Palestinian youth, youth, and I mean teenage, throwing rocks and so forth. When I went there in January or February, I looked at that scene, talked a lot about it, met with the entire cabinet of Israel, I began to develop the notion that uh, this outburst of the youth was almost as much against Arafat as against the Israelis. Very shortly thereafter, I got a, vi a visit from a Swedish friend, who, a deputy foreign minister, and he suggested I put together a team of American Jews to meet in Stockholm with uh, Arafat and discuss this with him and try to persuade Arafat, one, to disavow terrorism and two, even more importantly, to recognize the right of the state of Israel to exist. Prior to going, I knew that Arafat was going to say to me, who are you? Why should I even be talking to you? Well, anticipating that, a meeting was set up between Colin Powell, who was then the national security advisor. So we laid it out to him. We spent an hour with him. And exactly five days later uh, comes back the letter on White House stationery from Colin Powell, national security advisor, that if Mr. Arafat is going to do what you're asking of him, recognize Israel, disavow terrorism, he should rest assured that the, this administration will be responsive. When we got to the meeting, first thing Arafat says, who are you? Who do you represent? I pull out the letter. It's got White House stationery on it, Colin Powell's signature. And we went ahead. And uh, Arafat did agree to recognize Israel and disavow terrorism. Then when we got this thing done, the Swedish ambassador in Washington uh, took the agreement to George Schultz then Secretary of State, to get a visa for Arafat to read at the UN what he was going to do. I wake up the next morning, and the Secretary of State on the news has turned down the visa. I was astonished. You know what happened? The entire UN packed their bags and went to Geneva, and a few days later, Mr. Arafat goes to meet them in Geneva and reads uh, what we had agreed to. And I think George Schultz made a drastic mistake. 